everybody, I'm Heidi Rader here in the Alaska Garden. Today I'm talking to Nathan Belts here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Community Garden. Um, and it's a beautiful garden. It's a raised bed garden here on an old road actually. Um, so we're going to be talking with Nathan all about uh, managing the community garden. He's on the board here and you know kind of learning what goes into keeping track of um, you know, all the different gardeners and help, helping them succeed. <laughs> and then I'm going to talk a little bit about starting a community garden from scratch too. So sorry there's an airplane going by so hopefully you could hear all that. Um, so let's get started. So Nathan, uh, how long have you been involved with the UAF community garden here? So this is my second year on the on the committee, but the garden was actually started in 2012. Okay. Um, it was a joint effort between some graduate students, uh, the Office of Sustainability, and I believe there was some financial support from the UAF People's Endowment Grant. Okay, great. So how many gardeners do you have here? 50, roughly 50, it might be just shy, and so when I say 50, that's like individuals who signed up for plots, but there are people who share plots, um, there's families that have, have plots, and so they're spread out through the 102 raised beds that you see that you see here. Great. And it sounds like you have a little bit of fee, a fee for each garden plot that you garden? Correct. So there's a, our fee structure is divided into kind of two two groups. One group is for students and so students uh, can get any plot or any number of plots for $20 each and then anybody else it's 40 for the first plot and then 20 for any additional plot after that. That sounds pretty reasonable. So what type of, what do you use that fee to pay for? Uh, just general maintenance and upkeep of the garden. So. Um, you can see here one of these beds that's right next to you. We reconstructed about 12 of these. So prior to, they were kind of just some some old trim ends from lumber, and uh, they were rotted. So we tore those out and put put these new beds in this year at one of the first or the first work day that we had uh, for the season. Last year we did something similar on the lower end of the garden. We mm -hmm. did nine new beds down there. Um, you know, tools, you know, after a while things just like wear out or yeah. break or um, the mower and the weed whacker need fixing from time mm -hmm. to time or gas for the mower and the weed whacker. Um, uh, fence repair, we just put in, um, granted we didn't have to pay for this this year, but we just replaced the water system. So we had kind of an old rickety white PVC watering system prior to and facility services uh, on campus came in this year and used some old um, fire hose. Uh, and put that in for us so we can get uh, more water, better pressure, so more people can use the system um, at the same time. Whereas last year we had some issues with pressure okay. if you had more than like three or four people watering. Yeah. And to get the garden started, you know, it costs a little bit more for the fencing, I would imagine, and to build all the beds initially. So you got a g couple of grants initially to build the garden but then the fee pays to kind of for maintenance costs. Exactly. Yeah, that's my understanding. So like I said, yeah. the, the Office of Sustainability and the, the People's Endowment Grant I think were the, the primary sources of initial mm -hmm. funding. Um, but now uh, it is it is almost primarily just from the fees from the gardeners. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a really great opportunity for students who, you know, live in the dorms and don't have any place to garden. Is it mostly students who garden here, do you think, or is it, you know, faculty or uh, I'd say community it's a mix. members? I'd say we've got a, probably about um, a third students, and that would be a mix of undergraduate and graduate students, mm -hmm. um, a third uh, faculty and staff, and then a third of folks who are just um, part of the Fairbanks community and, and don't necessarily have an affiliation with the university. That's great. So um, as far as building community, do you, do you feel like, how do people help each other out? Do they share advice or um, do they help each other if somebody's out of town or how, how do people help each other in the garden or do they? Uh, yeah, they do. So we, we, we have uh, one work day a month during the growing season. Mm -hmm. So we'll start um, usually in um, May will be our first one, our first work day, and then uh, one each month until September, and September will be our last work day. And so we require that each 
gardener comes and participates in at least one of those work days so you mm -hmm. can meet folks um, and you know just kind of get a feel for who's here in gardening uh, but usually if you come in here on, in an, on an evening that there's any number of people here and so people will um, you know swap gardening techniques yeah. or if you've got pests this year we've had a really bad vole problem mm. um, and also recently a pretty bad aphid problem mm. and so one lady chose she started with the kind of soap and water method and then that was becoming too tedious so she went and purchased a bunch of ladybugs mm. and just started dispersing ladybugs on her plants which seemed to help and then it seemed like two weeks later uh, her her beds just got ridden with with bowls mm. um, and so her and I kept trading back and forth. Our, our techniques would seem okay. to work. Um, but then in terms of watering, we have these stakes here. So if you're headed out of town, um, you can put a, a pink stake or an orange stake in your plot, which just indicates that you need help watering. Um, we also have an active Facebook page uh, and an email listserv uh, and also a whiteboard in our garden shed where you can put that same information. Oh, hey, okay. I'm so-and-so, I have plots X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to be out of town for the next week. Would somebody mind um, hitting my plots with, with water? And that sounds like a great it idea. It tends to be a pretty successful method, yeah. um, though lately with the, all the rain that we've been yeah. having, um, <laughs> It hasn't caused too much of a burden on anybody else. Yeah. Well, it looks like if you're out of town and it's raining, but um, you can't eat your produce, you can also get some help with uh, folks eating your your produce while you're out of town, which probably isn't isn't too hard to find help with. <laughs> yeah. So we put those those signs in our community plots, but people are also welcome to to share or barter. Mm -hmm. I just traded some carrots um, with another young lady uh -huh. who has this plot over here. She uh -huh. had an abundance of kohlrabi. And yeah. um, I ran into her at the farmer's market and I was like, what are you doing with buying vegetables? Don't you have a plot? She's like, well, I can't grow everything. Oh. Um, but then we, we made a deal, uh, kohlrabi for carrots. Nice. Sounds like a great idea. Um, yeah, it looks like you've got all kinds of things growing here in the garden. I see some artichokes over there, potatoes, cabbage, um, really nice pole beans and, and tomatoes here too. So really up to the gardeners what they want to grow we don't really we don't put any restrictions other than um, we're an organic garden so uh, the plants that you put in or the fertilizers you use or the the pest deterrents or uh, fungicides or herbicides that um, those have to be organic yeah. in nature um, but yeah you'll see quite an eclectic mix I think somebody here got ambitious and was trying to grow watermelon mm. um, without a hothouse, so yeah. uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens there. So what other types of rules do you have or that kind of keep the community garden functioning well? Um, mostly just kind of rules of etiquette. So, you know, don't leave things lying around in between plots. That makes it difficult for um, the Office of Sustainability, who we trade them mowing and weed whacking uh, tasks for the plots that they have. Oh, so nice. they've got six plots up here. Um, and so if things are just kind of strewn about and laying around, then it, they have to spend extra time picking things sure, up and moving yeah. them. Sure, um, You know, just be courteous to other folks. Um, you know, if you've got pea plants or tomato plants like this, we ask that they don't go much above six feet is mm -hmm. what, we, what we say. You know, if it's, they're not thick and they're not going to block the light of another person's plot, say like sunflowers sure. or something, like let your sunflowers go. But if you've got really thick, dense yeah. peas or tomatoes, <laughs> you don't want to block other people's light from their plots. Right. Um, no dogs allowed uh, in the garden just so they're not rummaging through and mm -hmm. eating people's plants. I know my dog loves peas um, and loves kale and so yeah. they'll just go eat those right out of the garden. Yeah. I don't want to do that to somebody else's. Um, you know, lock up the lock up the gate when you leave, put the tools back in the shed, keep things organized, mm -hmm. coil the hoses up when you're done, yeah. um, try to just, just keep this, this space nice um, for everyone Those all sound here. pretty reasonable. Yeah. Um, what about rules about like letting your plot go to weeds or you know cleaning it up at the end of the season? Yeah. Do you have any rules? So we do. Um, again, those are mostly just, you know, guidelines you know mm -hmm. are we going to put the hammer down on you if you're not weeding your plot maybe if it's becoming like a nuisance or a real problem yeah. um, mostly we'll enforce that towards the end of the season mm -hmm. um, you know we ask that you know before snow falls you know the first significant snowfall that we get that you've got to clean your plot out just so there's not a bunch of stuff lying in there sure. and, and kind of like messy for the next season mm -hmm. Um, but if people want to put cover crops, if they intend to come back and they want to put rye seed down, then, then we'll allow that. Yeah. Nice. 
So do you replace the soil each year or every few years or um, do things like that or, or how do you it till depends. the soil and things if, like that? Uh, if a plot is like looking like it has a need for soil, like a little low, um, then, then we'll buy soil this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Office of Sustainability decided to buy some compost locally and had a big uh, lot of it dropped off and mm -hmm. so gardeners were free to take that and put in their soil but usually it's up to um, the gardener to put whatever nutrients uh, or soil amendments in that they want mm -hmm. and so what we haven't had in the past is a way of knowing who did what to their soil so this year we're going to do an end of the season survey where people can either anonymously or not anonymously elect to uh, give us their plot numbers and what types of soil amendments or additives they put into their soil so that if they're not here next year and somebody takes this plot and wants to know yeah. uh, what was done with it that they can have a good idea of what they may need to do next nice. year. Nice, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, do you have any sense of how much food or how much produce like one plot can produce and, mm -hmm. and how big are each of the beds too? So these are four by 12. So <clears throat> what we do um, just to make it easy, it's just a standard, um, you know, one foot wide board or two by 12. And we just buy a 12 foot section and then we buy a two by 12 by eight and then lock that in half. And so that makes the four by 12 plot. Nice. Um, and then we keep three feet of space in between each one just so that they're ADA accessible if we have gardeners oh, okay. who come and, and need uh, or, or have access needs. Um, but in terms of the amount of food, it really depends on, on how and what you're growing. Mm -hmm. So this person here, you know, has quite a variety of, of plants. So peppers and cabbage and beans and tomatoes and beans and lettuce. Um, so they've kind of got the mix going on, whereas my plots I've chosen to go kind of more like, you know, monocrop in mm -hmm. one plot. So I've got all potatoes in one, all carrots in another, and then beets and spinach in another. Okay. Um, and so last year I was able to grow in, in the 4 by 12 space 135 pounds of potatoes. Oh, I, wow. I double checked to make sure that I knew how much. <laughs> 135 pounds of potatoes, um, 95 pounds of carrots, um, and that was wow. just in the two beds I had here. That's pretty amazing. So that that makes a good comp contribution to your food for the year. Are you able to store, how do you store your potatoes and carrots? So the carrots, I did a mix of, just kept them in a bucket with water. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather used to put them in a burlap sack with uh, sawdust and then would oh. put them underneath the ice on uh -huh. a frozen lake and he'd oh, wow. keep them all winter that way. My father likes to just leave them in the ground, but they don't live in Alaska. Right. <laughs> um, so I put them in a bucket with water. That was fine because you want to keep them cold mm -hmm. um, and hydrated. Uh, but then it just got too cold outside. <clears throat> so those froze, but other ones I had canned. I'd put them in jars. Nice. Um, and kept them and they were great and semi pickled mm -hmm. and then the potatoes i don't have a root cellar but if you had a root cellar you could just put them there but i just mm -hmm. put them in burlap bags and put them in my um, second bathroom which i don't oh, use okay. <laughs> and stored them in the tub and kept the door shut so it was cool enough in there nice. and you know they were good and didn't start sprouting i think until february mm -hmm. that, that they were nice. doing all right yeah so you have a few plots here and you also have some plots at home it sounds mm -hmm. like so what's your main motivation for being part of the garden and helping to manage it so i grew up gardening i love i love gardening you know you could call it you know sustainable like a sustainable mm -hmm. practice or you could call it you know subsistence type practices and you know there's a lot of words that you could put to it but you know it was just something I've always done. It's a it's a lifestyle I've become accustomed to. I like growing my own food and knowing where my food comes from. Um, it really does, it's economical. It helps supplement what food I either, I have to go out and find and hunt or sure. what I buy. Um, but in terms of being part of the garden, you know, I just enjoy providing a space for others to do mm -hmm. that. And so it's it's me and, and five other people that are on the committee that manage the space and it, it really does take a number of people it would be hard to do um, on your own so mm -hmm. the distribution of effort is really nice um, 
but you know those feel good moments where you know the other day I was in here and you know it's a family that's gardening and you know this young uh, it was the granddaughter of a lady was like you know grandma grandma can I pick the peas <laughs> and she's like no these are beans and so she's learning right yeah. she's learning about that's great. you know where her food comes from and what the different plants are uh -huh. and, and you know what she can eat directly or what you may need to cook mm -hmm. first and um, so that that to me is very rewarding yeah that's great and so you guys on the committee um you guys are part of the board or is that what you call it or it, it's just a it's a committee so okay. technically the uf garden the, the uf uh, campus community garden is a student club oh, okay. um, it was started as a student club and so we have uh, myself i'm a faculty representative mm -hmm. on the committee um, we have a student rep, uh, graduate student representative an undergraduate student rep representative so tracy curry and daniel blair madrid um, then we have uh, Kelly Sivy, who was a former graduate student, um, Hillary King, uh, who actually works out at Calypso Farms, okay. and then Julie Riley, who's affiliated with Cooperative Extension at UAF. That's great. Um, so nice broad uh, perspective on the garden. Um, and then all of us who just enjoy gardening and, and providing great. space for people. Yeah. And then you guys are all volunteers, none of you are being paid for, for nope, your work. There's no money. It's yeah. all volunteer work, yeah. <laughs> And, and so how often do you guys meet and do, are you kind of making decisions by consensus more or less? Absolutely, as yeah. Arise? So most of the meetings will happen prior to the season. So mm -hmm. leading up to the season, what are the big projects that we need to get done? Um, you know, waiting till the snow all melts, coming in and, and evaluating the space and seeing what needs to be done. Um, you know, most of the work is getting people signed up and paying for mm. plots and figuring out who's going to have what plot. Like that's yeah. where a lot of the effort is kind of at the beginning. And then after that, it's mostly done. You know, we can do a lot of what we need to do by email. We will mm. meet in person um, probably a couple times a month. Um, and then at least another time leading up to a, a, a work day, mm -hmm. making sure that we know who's doing what. So we have at least two committee members at each of the work days just to kind of like manage and yeah. uh, divvy up tasks yeah that's and great that there's so more bringing than... food so some of the yeah. some of the money goes to like having snacks and meals mm -hmm. and so we do like a barbie bigger barbecue at the first work day and the last work day and then provide snacks at the other ones and um so that's that's where most of the work is mm -hmm. is you know um figuring out what needs to be done and then yeah. like going to buy all the lumber and yeah. um, you know buying the food and what, yeah. you know, whatever tools or you know hardware that we need right. to, to, to do the project. Well that's great you have a, sort of a team to help with all those chores rather than just one person I think that's how yeah. some oh, gardens end up is one person does all that work yeah. and, and, and that can be a lot for a volunteer. Right. Managing, <laughs> one volunteer. managing the Facebook page and the, mm -hmm. the emails too. Sure yeah. that's great. Um, so, so do you generally, you have over a hundred beds, is that enough room for the gardeners who are interested? Uh, right now is, so I think, um, if memory serves, uh, when we, when we finished taking in all the people who were interested in plots and then said, hey, does anybody else want an additional plot? You know, mm -hmm. so people may have had two, do you want a third one? Or if there's space, maybe you can have four, provided we give everyone who wants a third one first. We had seven plots left mm -hmm. out of the 102 and so we just turned those into community plots and mm -hmm. so um, there's a couple up here and I think the rest are all down on the lower end but Julie Riley got uh, donations from Anne's Greenhouse and Plant Kingdom and she just had some leftover seed of her own and oh, nice. um, at one of the work days it was the July work day uh, that we so sowed the seeds and put the starts in there and they're they're flourishing we've got cilantro out our ears now oh, great and, um, radishes are ready and mustard greens excellent so do you find do some people find they have more produce than they eat and what do they end up doing with that sure well we leave it up to each gardener to do what they want because mm -hmm. they're paying for the space right yeah. um, and so though it is a community garden the community is more about like building community between people and mm -hmm. not providing you know space where everyone can just come in and pick whatever right. they want um, and so we leave it up to those folks to barter with other people or share their vegetables however mm -hmm. um, however they choose to do so I know some folks will take their stuff to the food bank if oh, they've great. got like zucchini in excess or potatoes yeah. in excess um, or um, some folks have elected to bring um, vegetables to stone soup as well oh, nice. and 
Um, but by and large, you know, I think people are pretty good about eating their pretty eating whatever they've got. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So I know that some community gardens, uh, you know, they have different missions. Like one mission might be to build community. One might be to provide, you know, just save money or produce as much food as you can. Um, do you guys have a mission here as far as the garden or is there a main goal? I think everybody's got their own, their own mission. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the community garden committee is more about, you know, provide providing a space you know um, for you know a sustainable type practice and why we have like a good relationship with the mm -hmm. office of sustainability um, but for each each person it's probably a little a little, little bit, bit different, different reasons yeah. yeah that's great so what are some of the biggest challenges you have with managing the community garden and just the community garden as a whole uh, voles. Okay. <laughs> voles are, are a big mm -hmm. problem. Um, you know, last year it seemed like they were concentrated in maybe a couple plots, um, specifically one of our uh, committee members mm. plots up here, <laughs> but nobody else seemed to have a problem. This year they seem to be just about everywhere. Mm. I pulled up a handful of carrots the other day and they were just all like half locked oh, up on bummer. the bottom. Um, you know, weather, I mean, it's, it's all kind of the natural things of gardening, right? It takes it takes time, it takes patience, you know, you've got to like listen to your plants, you mm -hmm. got to show up, you got to, you know, look in, like check in on them, look after them. Um, but aside from all like, the, you know, the typical gardening type things is for the community garden, just managing people mm -hmm. mostly. So we, like I said, we've got about 50 people and there are a lot of different viewpoints um, and a lot of like a lot of different perspectives on how things should run or operate. Sure. Um, and so trying to figure out how to make everybody happy at mm -hmm. the same time, which you can never really do. So to the best of our ability, you know, we just, you know, try to you know, keep everybody. That's your job on the friendly. committee. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, not my job, but the committee's, <laughs> the committee's job. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about theft or vandalism? Have you had any issues with that? You have a nice fence here. Yeah. Um, so the, I mean, the fence is good. The fence probably does more to keep moose out um, mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to get in they probably could we have had issues with that in the past and mm -hmm. if you look around there's a few locations where it looks like the top of the fence is a little curled over um, up here near the, the top left corner and then also mm -hmm. down by the bottom we've got kind of a large um, uh, metal trash bin mm -hmm. that uh, we put a lot of compost in that um, facilities will come and dump at the, yeah. the larger compost oh, bin nice. and so I think people will hop on that and jump in but um we were having a rash of tomato thefts oh. recently and come to find out it was just a red squirrel we <laughs> we caught him at the work day and he had a um, tomato that was bigger than he was running off with it hopped over oh, the wow. fence and then dropped it and they went bobbling down the hill oh. and like so we all rushed over the fence to like watch him as he chased it down the hill oh. so it's pretty funny um but theft is a real it is a problem um another lady had a, a cabbage stolen um, last year, the ones, the plots I had, which were in reach of the fence, it was clear mm -hmm. somebody had like put their hand through the fence. Uh -huh. But, you know, if somebody wants those vegetables that badly, right. then it's like, for, for me, that's my perspective, yeah. not the perspective of the committee or the uh -huh. university or other gardeners, but my perspective is like, if they want it that bad, they might need yeah. it and there's yeah. never any damage it's not like somebody comes in like with the intent to damage property or damage plants in the sure. garden um they always do a very nice and neat and tidy job of like removing yeah <laughs> like for me it was carrots right and they like you know put the soil all back kind of nice afterward to make it look like oh, they have done interesting. anything wow well that's one of the many challenges i guess with the yeah. community garden is it's kind of an organization and you're working with a lot of people and it's not at your house so yeah. it's harder to, but, to so watch. So Stone Soup's community garden that's downtown they don't even have a fence oh, around yeah. it um, and to my knowledge like I haven't heard much about like them just having rampant theft mm -hmm. from their gardens. So. Hmm. Interesting. So we got a question um, what forms of integrated pest management are used at the gardens and integrated pest management is basically um, you know, using a lot of preventative pest management measures and using pesticides as a last resort. Of course, this is an organic um, garden, and so if pesticides were used, they'd have to be 
organic ones. Yeah. So uh, one thing we do, particularly for the voles, is just to make sure that um, the space is well mowed mm -hmm. um, and, and weed whacked well so that they don't have a place to hide. Um, and that seems to have done um, or has, has helped out a little bit. And um, we've also put up um, pollinator, or I don't know if this, you know, certain bees will help out with certain pests, but we have pollinator boxes oh, on great. some of these, these posts here. And that was, um, that was a student led effort. And I'm trying to think of the group that did it last year. They came to us and said, hey, do you mind if we put pollinator boxes mm -hmm. up? And we're like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, and, and then some uh, certain wildflower mixes. So I put wildflowers in my beds this year to attract things like dragonflies and butterflies mm, and other nice. types of um, insects that'll eat other types yeah. of um, more pesky types oh, of insects. Okay. Are you finding uh, pollinators are in the boxes? Oh, Is absolutely. Boxes? Yeah, oh, great. for sure. What kinds of pollinators? Um, I've, I've noticed um, more of like, you know, the the, the bumblebee nice. and the honeybee type. We do have, I, I haven't seen them in the boxes themselves, but we did have a wasp, or currently have oh. a wasp problem, but in that yeah. big compost bin at the bottom oh, I was telling you about. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I found that bumblebees will often make a nest in, in unintended areas. Yeah, as we, well. haven't, <laughs> we haven't noticed nests in the, the pollinator boxes oh, yet. Okay. And then not in our shed and, and nowhere mm -hmm. else, but um, we do have wasps. I'm noticing some bees flying, uh, flying around that sunflower oh, yeah. right now, too. That's great. Well, great. Well, that's, that's awesome. The garden looks amazing and um, really nice to just hear about all you've done to promote that community and, and help manage that. Um, do you have another question? What, do you guys have any problems with birds or geese? No. No, no, no problems with birds or geese. Uh, why that's the case, um, I, I mean, I would speculate that the large field, like the experimental mm -hmm. research yep. fields here that, uh, that UAF has, has something to do with that because it's always loaded with cranes and geese. Right. So probably keeps them over there rather yeah. than, than up here. Yeah, I used to farm over there and, and there were definitely, we had issues with cranes. Yeah. But but even the smaller, you know, smaller birds, like sometimes, you know, robins and sparrows and mm -hmm. stuff will, will come in and nip at seeds and things like that. And um, we haven't dealt with that at all. Um, maybe we're just lucky. And they're definitely a fan of berries, and so if it's primarily vegetable crops, mm -hmm. um, I don't think you'd attract them quite as much. But we do have, and conveniently enough, right, oh, yeah. uh, right behind us some, there, there's some folks who have elected to just have straight plots full of strawberries nice. um, as well. But um, that's about the only fruit that I'm aware of, all other than tomatoes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, there are no raspberries. Nobody's mm -hmm. growing raspberries here or anything like that. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, do you have anything else you'd like to share about the community garden? Um, as far as like if somebody was interested in joining, what, what they yeah, should that's do that's or? what I'd say. You know, we're we're always looking for new folks. There's mm -hmm. there was always a little bit of turnover every year. Um, we've had a, a lot of folks who have been with us since the beginning, um, which is great. And uh, but we're always looking for new new people who are excited about gardening. Um, so we do have a Facebook page. If you just okay. look us up at UA or the UAF Campus Community Garden on okay. Facebook, you'll find us. Um, we have a WordPress site, and um, we also have an email, which is just uh, uaf campus community garden at alaska.edu. Okay. And um, or just use Google. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Nathan, for showing us the garden today and talking a little bit about you know what goes into it as far as managing it. So that's a little bit about how to start a community garden here at Cooperative Extension Service. We've got a couple of great publications to, to help you get started as well. One is Community Gardens in Alaska, and that's just an overview of why you might want to have a community garden. Um, another one is com the Community Gardening Toolkit, and that's available through our Cooperative Extension catalog as well. That one's published by Missouri. Um, and some of the great reasons to have a community garden is that you're more likely to eat fruits and vegetables, you get a little bit of exercise, it really builds a sense of community and you can share advice with other gardeners as well. Um, and you're probably going to end up sharing with your friends and neighbors and even maybe the food bank as well. So those are all great reasons to have a community garden. 
I'm Heidi Rader here in the Alaska Garden. Thanks for joining. Thank you.